Amen. Amen. You may be seated. He is our righteousness. It isn't your righteousness. It isn't what you did. We're going to see that today as well. It is what he has done for you and through him. His righteousness is displayed. It's what he did, his act that he did for us. You familiar with Marco Polo? Maybe. No? Oh, Marco, what do you say when you're, oh, you're playing the pool game or something, aren't you? I, you slipped my mind there. Yeah. How does that work? Marco Polo, Marco Polo. Okay, anyway, <laughs> there actually was a person in history named Marco Polo. <laughs> so, I long for summer too. I, I, I miss it already. Anyway, but at, at 17 years old, Marco, all right, good deal, we're, we're on board. Marco Polo, this is serious, now he, at age 17, him and his father, and I believe his uncle as well, but they crossed, they crossed over Russia, they crossed Afghanistan, they crossed through the Himalaya Mountains, they crossed the Persian Desert, and they ended up, after all of that, man, I think it took them like two years or something to make this journey, they ended up in China. Well, after, after some time there, I believe, I hate to say it, but Marco Polo's dad had, a, had a, a relationship with Kublai Khan. And after some time there in China, Marco Polo establishes, he gets in Kublai Khan's uh, court. He becomes, he becomes one of the higher officers in uh, Khan's court. He ate with them ate with him, became an official there, and he saw great things. Uh, China was filled with things that those in Europe had never seen before. Uh, their, their fabrics, their, their trade, their, their cities, their towns, what they ate. People in Europe had no idea uh, that this stuff even existed. So Polo sees these great cities in China that would have made even the best uh, cities and towns in Europe looked like little run-down villages. He saw the power of gunpowder before Europe had a clue to what it was. He was at Khan's palace, that, uh, his palace and dining hall that seated 6,000 people and they ate on solid gold plates. Polo sees all of this. He tasted things that nobody had ever, uh, had ever heard of or, or knew of. Well, after 17 years in Khan's court over there in China, uh, he decides he wants to go back home to Venice. So he makes his return. He returns there, and once he gets there, what does is, what is Marco Polo want to do? He wants to share his stories. He wants to share what had happened, what he had seen. He begins to share, and, and people, the more and the more that Polo shares, the people believe him less and less and less. There's no way. Marco Polo, you've got to recant. You've got to confess. You've got to tell us that this isn't true. You're lying to us. There is no way that what you're speaking is true. Well, the story goes that at, at age 70, Polo is about to die. He's fixing to take his last breath. And, and literally, they say on his dying bed, people come to him saying, saying, Polo, you need to admit that you were lying all of these years, all this time that you have said what, what we've been missing out on, what you saw there. And Polo, Polo says with, his, with literally his last breath, he says, I haven't told you the half of what I saw. John chapter 11. We come in our study of John, and we talk about Lazarus. We come to the study, the, the story of Lazarus, and Lazarus gives us no clue, no inclination, no idea of what he saw. Lazarus gives us no insight. He tells us nothing. This man was dead and in the tomb for four days. What did Lazarus do? Where did he go? What did Lazarus see? What did he experience? He tells us nothing. Lazarus doesn't say anything. There is not a word recorded about what Lazarus did. He didn't 
uh, it doesn't say that Lazarus came out and he tried to explain. It doesn't say that Lazarus, when, he, when Jesus called him forth, it doesn't say that Lazarus drew a picture or anything. It, nothing, nothing to claim what Lazarus did or went through or experienced while he was in that tomb, while he was dead for those, those four days. Why, why didn't Lazarus write a book? Why, why didn't uh, uh, were the news medias go over there and interview Lazarus? What took place? What did you do? Did Lazarus just, was he just quiet? Did he not utter a sound about it? Now, some uh, rumors or old wives tell, I guess you would call them, say that Lazarus sat around for the, I believe he, was, he lived for another 30 years after Christ resuscitated him, called him out. Some people say he sat around with his frown on his face. I don't really believe that, but some people say he sat around with his frown on his face because what he experienced when he was dead for those four days, he so longed to be back there. And earth was not answering, not fulfilling that. Now, I don't, I don't believe that. But there's, Lazarus gives no idea, no, no insight to what took place. Maybe there weren't words for him to put down. Maybe he couldn't explain that. Maybe he could not find the sentences or the words to say. Maybe he thought, like Polo, if I, if I tell them what took place, what I saw, what was there, what happened, they won't believe me. They'll call me a liar. So I'll just keep my mouth closed. So we don't know. We don't know, but in John chapter 11, we come to the seventh sign. The seventh Samion. Uh, the Samion is, is a, it points to something beyond itself. Jesus is the Messiah. He's given these signs. The, the leaders, the, the religious leaders of that time have come to him and said, over and over, we want you to plainly show us, plainly tell us, who are you? Jesus has told them. He's revealed that to them through words, through action, through miracles. I am the Messiah, the blind man. Now he's going to raise Lazarus. So we've seen it time and time again how Jesus has plainly given them evidence of who he is, but they don't want to hear it. They don't want to have anything to do with this. So now Jesus, because they're wanting to stone him, Chad, go ahead and show that picture for me. I want to show you where Jesus went. He leaves Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem over here on the left, uh, the, the Dead Sea, the Jordan goes up that gray area, the middle of the, the gray area. Jerusalem is on the left. He's been in Jerusalem. Lazarus is in Bethany, which is 20 miles from, no, it's just, Bethany is two miles from Jerusalem. Jesus is going to go to Bethany beyond the Jordan. It has another name as well. We'll get to that. It's called uh, Bethabara is the is a name you might have on your map in the back of the Bible. But Jesus is going to leave Jerusalem, go to Bethabara, the one across the Jordan there, and it's about a 20-mile walk. So keep all this mileage in mind as we talk about the distance that might have been needed for a messenger or for Jesus to travel to return to Lazarus to comfort the family. So that's his Jerusalem. The leaders there want to stone him. He's going to leave and he's going to go to where John the Baptist had been baptizing. And we see that in John chapter 10 verse 40. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. So that's where Jesus is when he gets word about Lazarus. So here's the first thing we see today. Jesus brings life. Jesus gives life. John 11, 1 through 5. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now John tells this, this actual event hadn't happened yet, but remember, the Gospel of John was written many years after all of it took place. This would have been a well-known fact. The raising of Lazarus would have been known. The fact that, that Mary, that this ointment is used, that his feet are anointed, that she wipes his feet down with her hair, this would have been known around the village, around the community, in the area, in the nation. It would have been known. So John is writing this. 
this hasn't happened in our reading yet, but he's writing it because it has already happened in the time that he wrote it, so that he would, they would know, the reader would know everybody that is at this, at this appointment here. Verse 3, so the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So a messenger comes. Uh, a word has been sent to him. Verse 3, it says, word was sent to him saying, Lazarus is sick. You need to come. Now I told you that messenger, if they put that, if they put that note gave that word to a friend, a relative, a, a guy to run, a runner, he, would have, he could have ran that 20 miles in a day. Jesus sends word back with him, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. God's glory will be displayed through this. Now, you think about the nobleman. You think about some other miracles that Jesus did. Jesus didn't have to be present to heal anybody. He had spoke it when they were miles apart. He had spoke it and people were healed. Jesus could have just spoken something right there. And Lazarus could have been healed. But so, so it takes one day for the messenger to get to him. Jesus sends word back. Takes another day for it to get back, travel back. Lazarus died. You'll see that Lazarus died on the day and the time the messenger arrives with the word to Jesus. When he gives that word to Jesus, Lazarus is already dead. But he's going to wait. Jesus is going to wait. Now look what it says in verse 4. This sickness is not to end in death. Jesus says it's not permanent. It's not going to last forever. But then he goes on and says, but for the glory of God. He says God's going to receive glory through all of this. Now, out of this, we're going to see God's sovereignty. Did Lazarus need to die to prove that Jesus was the Messiah? Did Lazarus have to die for God to, to, to prove who he is, to prove that there is a God? No. It wasn't needed at all. Verse 6. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now there's a reason. There's a reason for four days, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? Like, come on, man. You've got to be kidding me. You want to go back there? I just told you he left Jerusalem, went to Bethany beyond the Jordan where John the Baptist had been baptizing. Why? Because they've already threatened twice to stone him. They want to kill him. So he comes and tells the disciples, he says, we need to go back. And the disciples say, you're crazy. You're nuts. You've got two strikes on you. These guys are good. They're not going to strike out. They're not going to miss you the third time when you come back. We assure you, you'll die the next time you go back. It's like, <laughs> you want to go, go on your own, but we're not going with you. We're staying here. We don't want any part in that. Don't expect us to make that journey with you. Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble. But he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus is saying, I'm in the Father's will. I'm in, when I'm in the Father's will, there's light. And as long as I'm in that will, I'm safe. I'm secure. It's not my time. It's okay. We can go. He says, I'm here. The light's here because I'm in my Father's will. Now let me ask you. This is for us. We can draw a parallel in our life today. You got questions in your life? You got concerns in your life? Are you in the, let me ask you, are you in the Father's will 
in your life. You wonder why, why things are cloudy, why things are dark, why you don't understand, why you don't see, why you can't hear. Are you in the Father's will? Jesus says, I'm in the Father's will. There's perfect har there's harmony with us, so I know that it's okay. No matter what comes. What do we do? What, what do we do in, in this day and time? We get, we, we get afraid. We're afraid because we don't know truth, because we're not in the Word, because we don't know what to do. We don't know which way to go. And because of that, what do we do? We start to, we freak out. We stress out. We worry. Why? Because we are not following after the Father. Jesus says, I'm following what the Father is telling me. Therefore, I'm not worried if they come for me or not. How does that apply to us today? Truth tells us how to live our life. Society gives us a different picture of the way we should live our life. Society tells us all these people you run around with, they're doing it. It's okay for you to do it too. You can go watch what they watch. You can say what they say. You can indulge in the things that they indulge in. You can live how they live. That's okay. That's the way society tells you, but God tells you something completely different than that. I shouldn't be around that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't see that. I shouldn't speak that. I shouldn't uh, do these things that, that y'all are, are doing. I shouldn't run around on my spouse like you're doing. I shouldn't cheat. I shouldn't have an affair. I should stay committed. Here's the second thing. And it doesn't really stop there either. Jesus, Jesus says, I'm in, I know the will of the Father, therefore I have light to walk in. I can see which way to go. Are you in the will of the Father? Because it doesn't just apply right there. Do you know what else? God has control over? We're going to see that God has control over even death. Death is no master to God. Death is not the end. God speaks to death. God, tell, God talks to death like it's a dog. God tells death, death set up. Death sets up. God tell death, roll over, fetch, stay. Death even listens to God. So who would you rather follow? The one that controls everything? Or do you want to follow the temporary world? Jesus is going to reveal that he's life. Verse 17. Now you, you know a little bit of the story. We need to skip on down. So when Jesus came, Jesus has made the journey now. When Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, the Jews believed. Here's why four days is important. The Jews believed that the Spirit hovered around, hovered above the body for three days. They believed that the Spirit was there hovering over that body just looking to see if there was some sign of life, just looking to see if they could see a breath, a heartbeat, uh, some kind of movement, a shaking something to signify that there's still life in that body so that the Spirit could return. So at four days, there's no questions being asked. Lazarus is dead. 18 through 21. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Verse 21, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now that's our prayer right there. What Martha says, Lord, if you, you that's the prayer that you pray today. Lord, if you would just do this one thing, this one time, I promise I'll never do it again. Anybody ever done that? 
You ever prayed those prayers? Has that prayer ever come off of your lips and out of your tongue? Huh? All right. You did it again, though, didn't you? Lord, if you would just this one time, if you'll just do this one thing, if you'll just get me out of this debt, if you'll just get me out of this hole, if you'll just do it, I promise, I promise I'll, I'll, never go, I'll never use that credit card again. I'll never go buy another pair of shoes. I'll never get another I'll never buy one of those hunting guns, one of those fishing reels, riding reels, whatever it is. I, I won't ever do that again, God. I know if you can just get me out of this this one time. I won't go back to that gambling boat or whatever it is, whatever your crutch is. That's our prayer. Our prayer is if you, if you will just do this one thing, if you'll just come through this one time. But look, look what happens, verse 22. Even now, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now this, a little faith. There's a little faith beginning to bud here. If you, even now, if you, even now, though, will do whatever God will, God will hear you. Even in this predicament, she has a little faith growing. She exhibits a little bit of faith here in this response. Even now, even though it's already happened, you speak to God for us, He'll hear you. What does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't scold her. Jesus doesn't say, how dare you, how, how dare you, Martha, you didn't have no faith in me that I could bring him back, that I could heal him, that I could, I could help you guys out. He doesn't scold her. He doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't lash out at her. If you have a little faith, Jesus will meet you where you are and he will begin to build from there. She shows a little faith, verse 23 and 4. Martha, Martha said to him, I know. You've said your brother will rise again. I know that. I know he'll rise again. In the resurrection on the last day, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So Jesus says, I know. I know this. Now, and Martha says, I, I know. I understand that he's going to be born again, that he will raise again, that he will be resurrected. How did she know this? How did Martha know this? She's a good scholar of the Bible. Martha knows her Bible. Turn to Job. Job chapter 19. Martha quotes... Quotes a verse, quotes, quotes scripture to Jesus. Martha says, I, you know what, I know he's going to be born again. I know he'll be resurrected. I know he will come out and all of it will take place. I understand that. But Job chapter 19, how did she know that? She knew, she knew that because of Job chapter 19, verse, verse uh, 25 through 27. And she tells Jesus, Jesus, I know. In Job chapter 19, verse 25 and 27. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at this last time, he will take his stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed. Yet from my flesh I will see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. So she says, I understand. I know that this is coming. And that's good stuff. She says, Jesus, that's good stuff. But then verse 25 and 26 of John 11. Again, Jesus explains to her, I'm the resurrection and life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Martha, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Jesus reveals, he says, he says God has given me this. God has placed me here. The Father in the heaven has revealed this. He is showing everybody who I am. He's showing everybody through the love of Christ. Christ did something for us that displays his love. Christ went to a cross for your sins. Christ went to a tomb for you. Christ took the iniquity of the world. 
Christ took it all upon his shoulders. Christ took everything that we've ever done, that anybody, every sin that has ever been committed, it was cast upon Christ. He did it because he loves each and every one of you. He reveals that through his love. Now, how do we know this? How do we know this? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. You're very familiar with these two verses. Romans 8, 10, 11. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So see there, it's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that allows you to live again. It's what I started off saying. It's not what you did. It's not that you were good enough. If He can raise Christ Jesus, He can raise you. Here's the last thing. Jesus displays that He's going to rise again. Now you know the story. You know how all this plays out. You've heard, heard the story of Lazarus enough. Jesus goes up to the tomb. He sees the family. He sees the, the friends, the, the visitors that have come to witness this. They're all standing outside the tomb. Lazarus has been there four days. And what are they doing? They're weeping. They're mourning. Jesus does what? Jesus weeps and is moved. And what does he do? He prays to God, verse 40 and 42, 41 and 42. They removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. Now, Jesus, Jesus didn't have to pray to God right here. Why? There's something different about Jesus and us. There was no sin in Jesus. Jesus had perfect, has perfect fellowship with God. They're one. They're, they're in constant communication. There is no sin separation in them. So Jesus doesn't pray on his behalf, but he prays to demonstrate to the people that the heavenly Father is listening. That is, he is aware. Verse 43. When he had said these things, he circled, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound, hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him him go. Jesus is showing. Jesus is display. I'm going to be put to death. I'm going to be put to death, but just as Lazarus is not held by this tomb, there's not a tomb that's ever been made, will ever be made, that can hold Jesus Christ. He says, no matter what device man makes that they think they're going to bind me up in, I'm coming out. Jesus says, look, just as Lazarus comes out, I'm coming out. They don't get it quite yet, though. They don't get that Jesus is going to come out. They don't get that he's going to die. They don't get that he's going to be raised again. Do you understand that he's coming back again? Because there's people outside that don't have a clue to that. They don't understand that. They don't believe in, they don't believe in him. They don't believe in the first time he was here. They believe he might, have, he might have been a good man. Good stories. Did some good stuff. But it's not true. They're not looking for the second coming. But he's coming back. What we was talking about on the way over here. Have you ever thought about the battle that's going to take place at the end? You know, growing up, 
Growing up, I thought, man, it is pretty intimidating. You know, I, I used to think, yeah, I want to be in that battle. That's going to be the coolest thing ever. I want to be right there on the front lines. I want to see all the bloodshed. I want to see Satan and his little demons. I want to see them get their, get their little rears handed to them and their hands and kicked all over a little Armageddon right there and uh, that area where it's all going to take place. That is going to be cool. It's going to be good stuff. I've kind of digressed from that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I've come to the point where I thought, you know what? I just seem just not be around when that takes place. I don't, I don't want to see that. I'll just be in the back lines. But there's not going to be much of a battle when he comes back. At his word. It's done. It's finished. We think in an earthly mind. Our mind churns and formulates and calculates what we know to be battles. We think of a 10-year Middle East conflict, war, terrorism from now till eternity. We think of a Vietnam, we think of a World War II, we think of a World War I, a Civil War. We think in terms of years, months, days, lives lost. But when Jesus returns at his word, Satan is finished. They're done. That's the power of Jesus. Death doesn't hold him. The grave doesn't hold him. Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust in a government? Are you going to trust in the world? Are you going to trust in the dollar? Are you going to trust in your retirement? Are you going to trust in Social Security? Because let me tell you, that's not going to last. That doesn't stand. Your faith and hope better be in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what your age is. You understand that Christ came for you and died for you? Whether you're 5, 95, 105, the Spirit's talking to you. You need to make a decision in your life. You don't need to leave here this morning not knowing when He calls the church, will I be in that group? When I take my last breath, will I experience the same thing as Lazarus? Do I know where I'm going when He calls me home? Maybe that's a decision for you. I don't know what you wrestle with, what your vice is, what your struggle is. Maybe you'd like to be a better parent, a better grandparent, a better spouse. You know, I don't stand out front and look over you, guilt trip you into coming down, stare you eye to eye and just make you feel guilty about what you need to do. I'm always willing to pray with you. Love to pray with you. You can pray. You can go straight to the throne of God, though. You don't have to have a priest, a pastor. You don't have to have a mediator to come between you and God to bring prayers up for you and petitions up to you from God. You can do that yourself. But I'd love to join with you, pray with you, support you, encourage you in any way. Most importantly, though, you need to know where your eternity is. I wonder about Lazarus. I really don't think he had that frown on his face. I think Lazarus, the rest of his days, were spent in laughter. I think the rest of his days, he laughed because he knew that death did not hold him, that there was something glorious 
and wonderful awaiting him. I believe when he sat at those tables, when he walked every day, he had a smile on his face because he knew that there was something greater. You can have that smile too because greater awaits you. Let's pray.